me. It says here the indulgence of lustful appetite wars against the soul. It is a constant hindrance to spiritual advancement. Those who yield to these lower impulses bear an accusing conscience, and when straight truths are presented, they are ready to take offense. They are self-condemning and think that the subjects have been purposely selected in order to reprove them. They feel grieved and injured and withdraw themselves from the assemblies of the church. Then the conscience is not so disturbed. Thus they soon lose their interest in the meetings and their love for truth and their love for truth. If these will crucify fleshly lusts, the arrows of truth will pass harmlessly by them. But while they indulge lustful appetite and thus cherish their idols, they make themselves a mark for the shafts of truth. If the truth is spoken at all, it must wound them. Today I'm pleading with you guys. There may be some of you in here today who are thinking, well, I know he's not talking to me. He probably wants this to hit me. No, move out the way. Move out of the way. Today, Satan gets revealed. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, as we begin this message, I pray, Lord, that we will all have that aha moment. I pray, Lord, that we will see how it is the devil seeks to come in and destroy relationships, destroy friendships, destroy brotherhood and sisterhood. Help our eyes to be open, Lord, and help us to recognize that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to let you know right up front that at the end of this message, I'm going to have an appeal. It is going to be a very pointed appeal. And I believe that if you respond to this appeal, you will see God working in your life in ways that you could not have imagined. General Lee's Special Orders 191. Have you ever heard of General Lee's special orders, 191? General Lee had made plans during one of his Maryland campaigns, during his Maryland campaign, wrote those plans out. General Lee and the South had been beating the North at every step, and, and after one particular battle, uh, uh, some Northern soldiers were crossing this battlefield that a battle had just taken place and they sat under a tree because they were discouraged and as they looked over to to the side of them they noticed that there was an envelope and the envelope had three cigars in it one of the soldiers took the envelope opened it and discovered general lee's battle plans it is said that that single event changed the tide of the battle George B. McClellan, the commander of the Army of Potomac, was overcome with glee at learning, uh, at learning the planned Confederate troops movement and reportedly exclaimed, now I know what to do. He confided to a brigadier, General Jen Gibbon, here is a paper which if I cannot whip Bobby Lee, I will be willing to go home. Beloved, what would you do? What would you give to have the enemy's plan for your life? What would you give to be able to see, ah, this is what he's up to. This is what he's up to in my life. This is what he's up to in my relationships. This is what he's up to in my church, in my churches. What would you do to be able to see behind the scenes of the devil's battle plan? Beloved, what I'm going to show you today is the devil's battle plan. And let me tell you, in a way, I want you all to get out the way. But in a way, we are all in the way. Because in a way, you will see, guess what? All of us have at one time or another been duped by Satan's plan. Are you with me? So, what is the devil's plan? If I were to summarize this sermon right now in a 40-second clip, 
this would be, there's some church members, I mean, some animals. <laughs> and, and you got other church members that are just like, man, look at them go. And then they dip, I mean, they leave. <laughs> Without even warning, they're just like, I'm gone. Let me ask you a question. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Beloved, listen to me. If I could summarize the enemy's plan in one 40-second video, this would be it. Because if the enemy can get us to be fighting with one another. Now, let me ask you a question. You need to see this, all right? So here we got brother against brother, or gazelle against gazelle, whatever they were, right? Uh, let me ask you, did anyone cheer for the animal that got caught? Was anyone like, yes, he's caught. The devil, <laughs> the lion got him. What were they busy doing? Were they busy? What were they busy doing? Fighting. Okay, what do you think they were fighting over? A girl. <laughs> Power. Territory. All right, now whatever it was in gazelle world, we, we're looking at it from the outside and we're going, what in the world? Was the fight worth it? No, but in, in gazelle world, the fight was worth it. And, and in that fight, they could not see what was coming because they were busy looking at each other. I have to whisper that for effect. <laughs> this is what they were busy doing. Now, let me ask you a question. All guilty parties, please raise your hand if you've ever done this before. Come on, guys. Come on. You know how it can be. We know the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but sometimes we look at flesh and blood. Listen to me. Every person in God's church is important and needed. Some people, every person in God's church is important and needed. Every person in God's church has special talents and special gifts that God has brought to this church for a reason and everyone is needed. Even when you think, I don't have a gift. And because of that, Satan hates and wants to destroy every person in God's church or God's kingdom. Why? Because every person in God's church or God's kingdom is needed. Everybody. How do you spell every? You know how to spell every. Every. Do I need to emphasize that more? Everyone is needed in the kingdom of God. And so Satan hates anyone who is seeking to do the will of God or seeking to be in God's kingdom. So listen, what I'm going to show you is this is how the devil, this is how he operates. And beloved, it's, it's bone chilling. Get out of the way. Say it with me, everyone. One, two, three. Get out of the way. In the beginning, God had a creation plan. God had a what, everyone? Creation plan. Genesis 1:26. God said, let us make man in our what? In our image and in our likeness. So God's plan was to create mankind. But the devil got jealous of that plan. Is that correct? Isaiah 14, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? which didst weaken the nations, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high. What was Satan after? He was after power, he was after position, he was after authority, this is what he wanted. He was jealous that he was not a part of God's creation plan with his son. Anyone know what the name Lucifer means? What does it mean? Lucifer means 
light bearer. I want you to keep the meaning of that name in mind. Lucifer's name means what, everyone? Light bearer. What does a light bearer do? Shines what? Shines light. Shines light. Very good. He was to shine light and he was to reflect the glory of, of God. Okay, very good. Check this out. Ezekiel 28. The Bible says, By the multitude of thy, of thy merchandise, speaking of Lucifer, by the multitude of thy merchandise, the, the Hebrew word there, rakula, it means trade. By the multitude of thy merchandise, or trade, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. So what was Lucifer doing in heaven? He was merchandising. He was trading. And if you're trading, that makes you a trader. Y'all not feeling me. <laughs> Lucifer was a trader. Amen. That's what he was doing in heaven. He was trading. What was he trading? That's the question. He was trading lies. He was trading deceit. Now check this out, guys. You have to see this. Because according to, and I, and I praise God as a church, we have special insight into what happened in heaven. Because let me tell you, when we see what happened in heaven, we can know Satan's plan. We can know that he doesn't change. The same thing he did in heaven is the same thing he'll try to do on earth. So watch this. All his acts, speaking of Lucifer, all his acts were so clothed with mystery that it was difficult to disclose the true nature of his work. Even the loyal angels could not fully discern his character or see to what his work was leading. Guys, I'm not now talking about bad angels, right? The angels that for whatever reason, you know, kind of like whatever with God. I'm talking about good angels. Is there anyone here who considers them a good, considers himself a good person? Okay, I know that's a trick question. You know, there is none good but one. I, I get it, I get it. But I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying you consider yourself, I believe that I am a moral person. I'm striving to do good, right? I'm not out trying to do evil. Right? I don't think there is anyone in our church here that is trying. That, there's no, we don't have a Satan in our church. Are you with me? We don't have people that are like, I would like, man, I love evil. Let's do some evil. Anybody want to? We don't have that here. I believe that what we have here are people who are seeking to do good. And that's in every church, I believe. People are, are genuinely like, we, we want to do good. But check this out. Even the loyal angels could not discern fully the work of who? Satan. His character, his nature. They could, everything he shrouded in mystery and by artful perversion cast doubt upon the plainest statements of God. And his high position gave greater force to his representations. Listen to this. Satan is the leader of every species of rebellion today, as he was the originator of rebellion in the courts of heaven. Standing next to Christ in power and glory, yet he coveted the honor that belonged to the Son. He desired to be equal with God, to carry out his purpose. He concealed his true designs from the angels and worked deceptively to secure their allegiance and honor to himself. By sly insinuations by which he made it appear that Christ had assumed the place that belonged to him, Lucifer sowed the seeds of what? Doubt in the minds of many of the angels. And when he had won their support, he carried the matter to God, declaring that it was a sentiment of many of the heavenly beings that he should have the preference to Christ. So here's my question. Who did Lucifer have an issue with? So what did he do? Who did he go to? Okay, hold on. <laughs> he had an issue with who? So he went to who? Wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible tell us? We're talking about Satan's plan of operation, right? Get out the way, guys. Say it with me, everyone. Get out the way. Amen. This is just to help you all get out the way, okay? If you have an issue with Christ, what do you do? You go to him, but what did Lucifer do? He went to the angels. So look, who did he go to first? He went to the angels. And then who did he go to afterward? Then he went to Christ. Then he went to God. 
You see how Satan operates? Wait, guys, we're not on earth right now. We are, we are angels in heaven. Imagination, okay? We are in heaven before earth has been created, and we're watching this unfold, and we're going, whoa, look at what Lucifer's doing. We're talking about Satan's battle plans. So, so, listen, Lucifer went out to spread the spirit of discontent among the angels. For a time, he hid his real purpose under an appearance of reverence for God. Suddenly, he planted doubts concerning the laws that govern heavenly beings, suggesting that angels needed no such rules, for their own wisdom was a sufficient guide. All their thoughts were holy. It was no more possible for them to do wrong than for God himself to err. This, the exaltation of the Son of God as equal with the Father was made to appear as an injustice to Lucifer. If the Prince of Angels could only attain to, this, to his true exalted position, great good would come to the entire host of heaven, for it was his purpose to secure freedom for all. Subtle deceptions through the wicked schemes of Lucifer were quickly growing in the heavenly courts. Do you see how Lucifer was beginning to sow discord among God's angels? So Lucifer, what does it mean? Light bearer. When Lucifer sinned, was he still a light bearer? Was he still a light bearer? Is he still a light bearer? Is Lucifer still a light bearer? But what kind of light bearer is he? False light. <laughs> Lucifer's superpower you guys get out of the way please do not defend Satan it up in this place today Lucifer's superpower is false light The true position of the Son of God had been the same from the beginning. However, many of the angels were blinded by Lucifer's deception. He so artfully instilled into their minds his own distrust and discontent that they did not recognize what he was doing. Let me ask you a question. Is he still doing that today? Okay, I'm not talking about people. Get out of the way. Is he still doing that today? So hold on. If Satan hates you, if Satan hates you, will he seek to put his thoughts of you in other people's minds? Lucifer had presented the purposes of God. It, <laughs> in a what? What is, what is Lucifer's superpower? False lie. Lucifer had put the purposes of God in a false light to excite dissent and dissatisfaction. While he claimed to be perfectly loyal to God, he urged that changes were necessary for the stability of the divine government. While secretly stirring up conflict and rebellion, he made it appear that his only purpose was to promote loyalty and to preserve harmony and peace. Let me ask you, from looking at what he did in heaven, do you believe that Satan seeks to do the same thing today in our relationships, in our families? with our friends, in our churches. What do you think? Get out of the way, guys. This is not about you. This is not about me. This is about revealing the plan of the enemy. Get out of the way. You know what filters are, right? How many Instagrammers we have here? Or You, you know what a, what, a, what a filter is, right? A filter changes your perception of the picture. A filter changes the color of the picture. Do you think Satan has filters? When the angels began sharing false light, they became false light bearers, became as Lucifer himself. Lucifer was trading false light. Did you catch that? What Lucifer began to do in heaven was put a, put a filter over the minds of angels so that when they looked at God, they were like, hmm. hmm. I hadn't seen that before. And now anytime they turn their eyes to look at God, 
because they were looking at God through a particular filter, all they saw was what Lucifer told them. So what should Lucifer have done? What would have stopped, what would have possibly stopped this rebellion in heaven? Uh, Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take, it to, with, with two, with, take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if you neglect to hear them, tell it unto the what? What did Lucifer do first? He went to the... He went to the angels first. Then he said, now... Now let's go to God. Was Lucifer interested in reconciliation? Like whatever his issue was with, with, with God. Oh God, you know, he's a mean guy. Whatever. Was he really interested in reconciliation? No. No, guys, I want to say something to you right now. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Are you out of the way? If you're out of the way, just let me see your hands right now. Right, if no one's thinking, you talk about, please, I just want to see, because I'm not talking about you. <laughs> I'm not talking about flesh and blood. I'm talking about Satan himself. Listen, so the Savior gathered his disciples about. You remember the disciples were having issues with each other? What was their issue? Who's going to be the greatest? Yeah, yeah. So the Savior gathered his disciples about him and said to them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. There was in these words a solemnity and impressiveness with which the disciples were far from comprehending. That Christ discerned they could, that which Christ discerned they could not see. They did not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom, and this ignorance was the apparent cause of their contention. But the real cause lay deeper. By explaining the nature of the kingdom, Christ might for a time have quelled their strife, but this would not have touched the underlying cause. Even after, after they had received the fullest knowledge, any question of precedence might have renewed the trouble. Thus, disaster would have been brought to the church after Christ's departure. Let me ask you, what is it that brings disaster to Christ's church? Precedence. Supremacy. Striving. The strife for the highest place was the outworking of the same spirit which was beginning, which was the beginning of the great controversy in the worlds above and which had brought Christ from heaven to die. There rose up before him a vision of Lucifer, the son of the morning, in glory surpassing all the angels that surrounded the throne and united in closest ties to the son of God. Lucifer had said, I will be like the most high. And the desire for self-exaltation had brought strife into the heavenly courts and had banished a multitude of the hosts of God. Had Lucifer really desired to be like the Most High, he would never have deserted his appointed place in heaven. For the Spirit of the Most High is manifested in unselfish ministry. Lucifer desired God's power, but not his character. He saw for himself the highest place, and every being who is actuated by his spirit will do the same. Thus, read it with, together with me, everyone. Thus, alienation, discord, and strife will be what? What's that word? Inevitable. Dominion becomes the prize for the strongest. The kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of force. Every individual is regarded, uh, regards every other as an obstacle in the way of his own advancement or a stepping stone on which he himself may climb to a higher place. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. This is not about you or you or you or you or you or you or you. This is, we are in a war room right now. No, 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 let me turn this way. Because <laughs> I don't want to be like, I'm talking. We are in a war room right now. And we are looking, whoa, that's Satan's plan? Whoa, it, so, you, you follow me? This is a war room right now. This is God's war room right now. And God is revealing to us how the enemy seeks to disrupt the work he wants his church to do. So, you know the story. Lucifer and his angels are cast out of heaven. And, um, and now, Lucifer turns his sight on Adam and Eve. And guess what he does? What is his superpower? False light. Genesis 3.1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said. What is he doing? 
What, he's merchandising. What is he merchandising? False life. He's saying, look, I know how you see God, but, but I have something to tell you about him. And once, check this out, the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die, for God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. What had he effectively done with Adam and Eve? He put a filter on their minds. Yeah, whoa, I, man, thank you for opening my eyes. Y'all didn't catch that just now, did you? Thank you for opening my eyes. The eyes of them both were what? Open, and they knew that they were, when they sinned, their eyes were opened. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife and his wife hid themselves. God comes looking for them. They say, we hid because we were what? Okay, pause for a second. Check this out. What else did he say? The woman that you... Okay, okay, watch this. Were their eyes open before they sinned? Were Adam and his eyes open before they sinned? What do you think? Yes or no? Yes, let me see your hands. Their eyes are open before they sinned. No, let me see your hands. Their eyes were not open. Okay, you're both right. <laughs> they could not have seen the tree if their eyes weren't open. So, the eye, what do you, how many of you ever said, yeah, I see what you're talking about? What does that mean, I see what you're saying? I what? I understand. So when Adam and Eve sinned, guess what eyes were open? The carnal mind. That's what God opened. Look, look, look. Romans 8, 7. The carnal mind is what? Enmity against God, for it is not what? Subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. When Adam and Eve sinned, the carnal mind was open. Now, do you think the carnal mind has filters? So watch this. When the loving beautiful, amazing, gracious, merciful, <laughs> compassionate God of heaven comes to the garden looking for Adam and Eve. What do they do? What is in the very fact that they are hiding, what are they doing? They're accusing God. Of being someone who is unapproachable. Once the carnal mind takes over, there is a filter that is placed on it that says, Yeah, God, um, you're, in the, you're a vindictive God. That's why I had to hide because, you know, I'm afraid you might kill me. So I can't really talk to you if there's an issue. Oh. The woman. The woman what? So who's being blamed? The carnal mind naturally casts false lights. If you want to know why God's church, usually we have so many issues with one another. Watch this. This is crazy. Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Those who set themselves against the government of God have entered into an alliance with the Ark Apostate. He will cause everything to appear in a... Many thus led by Satan deceive themselves with the belief that they are in the service of God. In the days of Christ, the Jews subscribed, the Jewish scribes and elders who professed great zeal for the honor of God crucified his son. The same spirit still exists in the hearts of those who set themselves to follow their own will in opposition to the will of God. Let me show you an example of false lights. Exodus 16:2. The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Yo. 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 
straw. I was walking by Moses' tent. I was just minding my business. And I heard they trying to kill us with hunger. Bro, I kid you not. On the real. Yo, you serious? Yes. Go warn the camp. <laughs> they fought this. They weren't just talking like, oh, you're trying to kill. No, they were like, yo, the dude is trying to kill us. That's why he brought us out here. Hold on, wait, wait. Exodus 17, 3. He thought it was just one time. No, 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 no. And the people thirsted for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Where, wherefore is it that thou brought us up out of Egypt to kill us? Wait. And our children <laughs> and our cattle. Yo, bro, I was walking by Moses' tent again. And this time, he didn't just say he's going to kill us. He after our children. He trying to get our kids. And this spread through the camp. Yeah. So that the children of Israel murmured. Not one person here or one person there. The entire camp. He's trying to kill us. Remember Korah's rebellion? Yeah, is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land of if uh, a land brought us up of a land that flowed with milk, with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself a prince over us. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into the land that flowed with milk and honey. You have not given us an inheritance. Will you put out our eyes, the eyes of these men also? We will not come up. They were like, yo, I'm telling you, Moses, Moses, man, he will put your eyes out. Yo, that guy is crazy. Look in the eyes. I heard it myself, yo. False light. Check this out. You know what happened in the story, right? The, uh, the ground opened up and God swallowed up the rebels. And then the very next day, the children of Israel murmured, said, Moses, you have killed the people of the Lord. This, is, this one is amazing. Notwithstanding, you would not go up but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. You murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us. <laughs> Yo, I was walking by Moses' tent. And Moses was talking with God. And guess what God said? He said, I hate them. Yo, I heard it with my own ears. How is the devil so powerful that he could make one believe that God hates? Filter, carnal mind. So, guess what? Guess what, everyone? Praise God. You know why Jesus came into this world, right? Why did Jesus come into this world? Okay, but think about what we've been talking about. Why did he come into the world? Because Satan had been putting his father in a what? False light. So Jesus comes to be the true light. Yes, yes, yes. Check this out, guys. Christ came into the world to, re to represent the father to man. For Satan had presented him before the world in a? Because Satan's superpower is false light. You see, through false light, Satan can turn the best of friends into enemies. Through false light, Satan can take the, the best of church members and make them hate each other. Through false light, the enemy can do so much because he doesn't need to depend upon truth. He just picks the filter and says, yep. Because God is a God of justice, of terrible majesty, who has power to destroy as well as to preserve man, Satan caused men to regard him with fear, to look upon him as a tyrant. Remember, Jesus said, he that's seen me has seen the who? Father. So, amen. Jesus came into the world, except there was a problem. Because at the end of Jesus' life, 
Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will you that I do unto him who you call king of the Jews? And they cried out, What? Hold on, guys. Wait a second. How in the world are the Jews calling out for the crucifixion of Jesus? Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil has he done? I want you to notice how the next, how the next sentence goes. And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. Now, do you get what just happened here? Do you get what just happened? Why did they cry out more exceedingly? Why didn't they cry out the same? You know, he asked, what should I do with them? They said, crucify. And then he asks, what? What evil has he done? And when they heard that question, they were like, they lost it. They were like, crucify him. Why? Let me tell you why. In Matthew 9, Christ had been accused of falsely claiming to forgive sins. He had been accused of eating with publicans and sinners. He had been accused of laboring on the Sabbath. He had been accused of working the power of Beelzebub. He had been accused of breaking Jewish tradition. He had been accused of, of, of destroying the temple and building it again in three days or claiming to build it again in three days. He had been accused of, being a, of, of claiming to be a prophet. He had been accused of falsely claiming to be the son of God. He had been accused of not paying taxes. He had been accused uh, 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 on the question of divorce. He had been accused uh, of hypocrisy. He had been accused of, of eating with sinners. He had been accused of over... How do you find 40 things to accuse Jesus of? You got to stop and think about that for a moment. If you try to come up with 40 things to accuse me of, or I try to come up with 40 things to accuse you of, we might probably do pretty good. <laughs> because guess what? We are all sinners. But how is your mind so corrupted that you can find 40 things or more to accuse Jesus, the perfect one of? So all these little false lights that kept going against Christ. Yeah, man. Did you hear? Yeah, he, he broke the Sabbath. What? Okay. Hmm. Let me tuck that away. Yo, did you hear what? He, he was talking about eating flesh and blood. What? Whoa. So by the time it comes to, the, to, to that scene, when they cry out, crucify him, they're not just like, oh, you know what? We think this will look good in a book down in the future that we were really mad at him. No. <laughs> they cried out, crucify him because of all the things they had heard and never went to Jesus to say, hey, Jesus, it, did, did you say that we have to eat flesh and blood? The human heart tends to vilify what it does not understand. Jesus said, or the Bible says in John 1, for in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shined in the darkness and the darkness what? Comprehended it not. So what do they do? Check this out. And he said these things unto them. The scribes and Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might what? Accuse him. Luke 20, 20, they watched him and sent forth spies which should feign themselves just men that they might take hold of his words so that they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. Satan will try to set you up. She says here, I'm just going to read the bottom part here. Their criticism of Christ and his disciples was severe and denouncing and placed them in a what? What is Satan's superpower? False lies. So check us out. Christ ascends to heaven. Amen. Remember our opening scripture? Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in what? Battle. So hold on a second. Check this out, guys. How is Jesus entering heaven mighty in battle when he has just been accused of all this stuff and died put to death at the cross? How was he mighty in battle? I want you to think about that. Deuteronomy 20.10 says this. When you come against a city to fight against it, proclaim, then proclaim peace unto it. <laughs> 
Hold on a second. God's method of dealing with his enemies, when you come against a city to fight against it, the first thing I want you to do is proclaim peace. So did Jesus come to this earth to fight? Did Jesus come to this earth to fight? Yeah. And what's the first thing he does? He proclaims peace. The gospel. Listen to me, beloved. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall what? Nothing shall cause them to fall. Nothing shall offend them. Listen, guys. What is the law that Jesus was talking about? Remember, the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God. What is the law? Romans 13, 10 says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So the carnal mind is not subject to loving. You guys, did you hear what I just said? The carnal mind is not subject to loving. No, the carnal mind wants to see evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Because a carnal mind is a mind that hates. And a mind that hates wants to find reason to hate. So now I've got this filter that says, this is why I don't like you. This is this. Beloved, get out of the way. It's not about you. It's about how the enemy is seeking to destroy relationships. What is love? Love suffers long. Love is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemingly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let me ask you a question. The greatest text that reveals God's battle plan is John 3, 16. For so, do you remember that Christ was the only one allowed into the councils of God? Yeah. And therefore, he knew God's battle plan. Yeah? So guess what? If you want to know God's battle plan, where do you need to go? In council with God. Remember the disciples were all fighting with each other? I don't like you. Yeah, well, I don't like you. I mean, think about that. We're followers of Christ. By the way, I don't like you. You know what Christ invites them to do? He invites them to go to a place called the upper room. If I might, let's just change the name of that upper room to the war room. <laughs> that was the war room. That's where they fought the battle. In the war room. So, so Acts 1.14, these all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. And what happened as a result of their prayer and supplication? What happened to the fighting and division among them? What happened? What happened to the filters in which they saw each other? Yeah, Peter, I know who you are. Yeah, John, I know who you are. Yes, yeah, Simon. What happened to those filters? They were gone. And beloved, check this out. When a filter is removed... You can mend a relationship in five minutes or less. Amen. When a filter is there, there's really no hope. You might think I've mended the relationship, but you haven't. It's a lie. You might be like, <laughs> nothing's going on. It's just another fake moment. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, the day you're not here. <laughs> so listen to this powerful statement when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rush, rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting the spirit came upon the praying disciples with a fullness that reached every heart amen everyone heaven rejoiced in being able to pour out the riches of, of the spirit's grace amen everyone words of penitence and interrogation mingled with songs of praise Yes, 
yeah, yeah, words of penitence and interrogation. So Peter, hold on, before the Holy Spirit is poured out, I need, do you remember what you said to me five weeks ago? Because I'm not praying with you until you admit what you said. So, so just hold on, Holy Spirit, please wait. Peter? No, 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 no. It doesn't say that, does it? I have added the word interrogation in accidentally. <laughs> the word is confession. They were not concerned with, well, you, you're, you were wrong here. Yeah, I was. Okay, all right. Now, now, okay, now. No, they were like, look, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Let's call it even. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We both are in the need of the grace of God. So if we can acknowledge, hey, you know what? I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. God has a work for us to do. Let's not try to interrogate each other. Let's be about our father's business. That's what happened in the war room. Listen. Revelation 12, 1 through 4 speaks about this woman who is the church. Listen carefully, guys. This is coming down to us now. I need you to focus. By the way, I need you to get out of the way. Revelation 12, there's this woman who is pregnant with a child. That child is the child of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that as she is giving birth to this child, the dragon is standing before her trying to devour the child. I have a question for you. Who is the woman? The church. Is Jesus Christ the last child she had? Is that a trick question for you? Like, are you thinking? Is Jesus Christ the last child she had? No. Every time a person is born again, the church has given birth to a child. So the devil... <laughs> The devil does not want the church bearing children. So he has to come up with a form of, please follow me here. He has to come up with a form of birth control. You're not feeling me. <laughs> You're not feeling me. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. Listen, we can't have you having kids. So we've got to find a way to stop you from bearing children why because that's the great commission go ye into all the world bring people into the church have people born again when people are born again they are a new creation remember how satan felt about the creation of man he feels the very same way about the recreation of man so if he sees wait a minute the church hold on <laughs> wait a minute the church is planning to do a big recreation event no nah, we can't have that the church is planning to reach out and to witness and, and to reach its community. Nah, 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 we can't have that. And beloved, now you and I can know, oh yeah, this is to be expected. If that's what the devil did in heaven over the creation process of man, we can expect that he would do the same thing when we are planning a recreation process. This is Satan at work, church. Satan's battle plan is to accuse one another. Matthew 24, 12, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Matthew 6, uh, uh, Psalm 64, verse 6. Listen to what Satan will inspire you to do. They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search. Both the inward thoughts of them and the heart is deep. In other words, you, I got light. That's what Satan comes to. Man, this is light. Hey, look at this person and look at that person. And he goes on this accusation rampage in order to separate brothers who love each other. Let me ask you a question. Do you think the angels in heaven loved one another? Yeah. Do you think there was a time that wicked angels now were in sweet fellowship with angels in heaven? Do you think there was a time? Yeah, they didn't always. It wasn't always this. Week. There was a time that these angels were the best of friends. And Lucifer, the mastermind, was able to separate the chiefest of friends. 
Beloved, listen to me. I am pleading with you as a church. Let us see what the enemy is up to. Listen, I am almost done. But this is important enough for me to go. To, I am almost done. Philippians 2.2. 2. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love be, being of one accord and one mind. God calls us to what everyone? To love. Listen to me. I know. I know what it is. Look. If you're looking at someone right now and you're like, yeah, I hate you. Guess what you're wearing? You're wearing, off, you're wearing, you're wearing filters. God does not see us for what we are, but for what we can be in him. You may be looking at someone with problems. I'm not saying no one has problems. What I'm saying is, what filter are you looking through? Are you looking through the filter of love, or are you looking through the filter of the carnal mind? Amen. That's why the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's asking us, he's saying, listen, you cannot see people differently with the carnal mind. You have to get rid of the filter. And the only way to get rid of the filter is to get a new mind. Because when you get a new mind, you now see people as Jesus sees them. Listen, I have a, I have a series of quotes I'm going to read to you, and then we're going to wrap this thing up. You got, and then I'm going to give you a challenge. You have to hear these, beloved. Christians should regard it as a religious duty to repress the spirit of envy or emulation. They should rejoice in the superior reputation or prosperity of their brethren. I'll let you know when, Jackie. You can sit there, though. They should rejoice in the superior reputation. Beloved, come, come on, tell me. What is the carnal mind like? You're not superior than me. You're not better than me. It's that very attitude. Listen, guys. I'm not the best preacher in the world. Please. I rebuke you. <laughs> it's a kind rebuke. It's a kind rebuke. I'm not the best preacher in the world. She's not the best musician in the world. You are there are not the best musicians in the world. You're not the best deacon in the world. You are not the best elders in the world. <laughs> You're not the best church member in the world. You're not the best church in the world. You are the best church in the world. You're, you, get, you, get, you get the part, right? We are not the best anything. And once we realize we're not the best anything, we're not going to have issues with other people who may exemplify a gift that might be, oh man, that's, a, wow. We, she says they should rejoice in the superior reputation or prosperity of their brethren, even when in their own character or achievements seem to be cast in the shade. It was the pride and ambition cherished in the heart of Satan that banished him from heaven. These evils are deeply rooted in our fallen nature, and if not removed, they will overshadow every good and noble quality and bring forth envy and strife as their baleful results. You remember Saul and David? You remember the story of Saul and David? You know what Saul was wearing? Filters. One verse, God. Saul, 1 Samuel 18, 9. And Saul eyed David from that time forward. That's a funny verse to me. That is so funny. Like Saul eyed David from that day on. It just, every time I read it, and Saul eyed David. And why was he eyeing David? Because they were singing, David has slain his ten thousands, while Saul has slain his... And Saul began to see David through a filter. Beloved, listen to me. That is the work of the carnal mind. Please, church, I hope right now that, that every one of you are loving me as I am loving every one of you. Because I hope at the end of this, none of you come and say, Pastor, you were talking about me. Because I am not. Get out of the way. 
I will smile with you afterward and hug you and let you know, hey, it was, it's not about you. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. Listen, false lights and filters come in many forms. It can be jealousy. It can be racism. Yes, racism. You're a different color than me, and I don't like that. It can be pride. It can be power. There are multiple false filters, beloved, that we have to understand that is the way the enemy comes in. From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Speak not evil of one another. Beloved, listen to me. We have all. We have all been guilty of this before. All. All. All been guilty of this before. God forgive us for playing into the devil's hands. God forgive us. For having our eyes blinded and not seeing what the enemy seeks to do. All so that we will not be out doing our father's business. Report and we will report. I heard, for I heard the defaming on many, of many, fearing on every side. Report, they say, and we will report it. All my familiars watch for my halting, saying, Peradventure he will be enticed and we shall prevail against him. And we shall take our revenge on him. This should not be our attitude. Listen. In past ages, there have been those who have exercised the capabilities and powers in doing a work by the Holy Spirit, by the help of the Holy Spirit, which constituted them laborers together with God. But there have also been those who have criticized their work and rejected the messages which they bore. So it is today. There are those in responsible positions who, by their word and actions, sow seeds of doubt and unbelief. These seeds are called tares by our Lord, and those who sow it are under the guidance of evil angels. That's rough stuff, guys. They are at work both openly and secretly, seeking to counteract the work which God has appointed his divine agencies to perform through human agencies. All who do this work see this work see with defective and perverted eyesight did you catch that guys all who do this work see with defective and perverted eyesight their imagination is inspired by satanic agencies and they see many things in a okay put on your seatbelts if you didn't put them on before we're wrapping up, I promise you, the pastoral wrap-up. But you have to hear this. It is not God's plan that reports regarding the work of his servants shall be passed from one to another. My brethren, when someone comes to you with an accusation against a fellow worker, how many workers do we have in here? How many workers do we have in here? Oh my goodness. How many workers do we have in here? If you're a Christian, you're a worker. How many workers do we have in here? It is not God's plan that reports regarding the work of his servants shall be passed from one to another. My brethren, when someone comes to you with an accusation against a fellow worker, say to him, let's read this together. I don't want to, I don't even, let's read this together. Say to him, have you gone to the one you are accusing in the way in which Christ has told you to go? If you have not done this, Okay, I hear like five, like ten people reading. <laughs> Why don't you want to say this? <laughs> Let's read. If you have not done this, I am not at liberty to what? Listen to what you have to say about him. Wow. Those who are Bible Christians will do as Christ has directed. If his directions were followed, many wounds would be cured that are now left to fester and break out until they are incurable. To follow the course laid down by the great teacher who never errs in counsel is the only way to stop the false tongue and cause criticism and accusing to cease. Floating rumors are often the destroyers of unity among brethren. There are some who watch with open mind and ears to catch flying scandal. 
They gather up little incidents which may be trifling in themselves, but which are repeated and exaggerated until a man is made an offender for a word. Their model seems to be report, and we will report it. These talebearers are doing Satan's with surprising fidelity, little knowing how offensive their course is to God. If they would spend half the energy and zeal that is given to this unholy work in examining their own hearts, our own hearts, they would find so much to do to cleanse their souls from impurity that they would have no time or disposition to criticize their brethren. The door of the mind should be closed against they say or I have heard. Why should we not, instead of allowing jealousy or evil surmising to come into our hearts, go to our brethren and ask, and after frankly but kindly setting before them the things which we have heard to their, heard detrimental to their character and influence, pray with them and for them. While we cannot fellowship with those who are the bitterest enemies of Christ, we should cultivate the spirit of meekness and love that characterize our master. A love that thinketh no evil and is not easily provoked. Christ laid down rules. Ellen White is preaching now, okay? I'm, I'm just listening to her. Christ laid down rules to prevent unhappy divisions. But how many in our churches have followed his directions? Matthew 18, 15 to 17 is quoted. And then she says, If these instructions which Christ has given were followed out in the spirit that every true Christian should have, if each, when aggrieved, would go to the offending member and seek in kindness to correct the wrong by privately telling him of his, of his fault, many a grievous trial would be averted. When anyone comes to a minister or to men in position of trust, with complaints about a brother or sister, let them ask, and this is said again, if he has failed to carry out particular, the particular of this instruction, do not listen to a word of his complaints. Refuse to take up a report against your brother or sister in the faith. <clears throat> if members of the church go entirely contrary to these rules, they make themselves subject of church discipline and should be put under the censure of the church. This matter, so plainly taught in the lessons of Christ, have been passed over with strange indifference. The church has either neglected her work entirely or has done it with hardness and severity, wounding and bruising souls. Measures should be taken to correct this cruel spirit of criticism, of judging one another's motives, as though Christ had revealed to men the hearts of their brethren. The neglect of doing a right with wisdom and grace, the work that ought to have been done has left churches weak, inefficient, and almost Christless. Guys, I don't know about you. I don't want a Christless church. No, 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 no. I know about you. I know you don't want a Christless church. So, beloved, if you and I don't want a Christless church, let's do what Christ called us to do. If this instruction is not heeded because we choose to disobey, doing the very opposite of that which Christ has told us to do, how will it be with our religious life? We shall be found communicating to others, to one another, the faults of our brethren in the church, and those evil reports will spread. This evil surmising and suspicions of dishonesty will spread from lip to lip, notwithstanding the plain directions given by Christ not to sow the seeds of evil by speaking evil of our brethren. Those who pursue a course contrary to this instruction are creating in their own hearts the evil they condemn in others. And thus are themselves brought under condemnation. The Bible plan of avoiding and remedying difficulties among brethren is the only safe plan. Christ is grieved to see some disregard this instruction, follow their own plans, plans opposed to his. When those who claim to be Christians walk in harmony with divine instruction, there will be far less evil surmising and evil speaking in the church. Can someone say amen to this? Amen. Beloved, I got one more quote. If Satan can imply, it can employ professed believers to act as accusers of the brethren, he is greatly pleased. For those who do this are just as truly serving him as was Judas when he betrayed Christ. Although they may be doing it ignorantly, Satan is no less active now than in Christ's day, and those who lend themselves to do his work will manifest his spirit. You guys, do not be a traitor. Did you catch what I just said? Do not be a, a traitor. Because that's what the devil does. Psst, 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 psst. Yo, guess what? Psst, 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 psst. Yo, hey, guess what? Psst, 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 psst. Yo. That's the devil's MO. 
those who speak, those who think and speak evil of their fellow laborers, open the mind to false reports, and taking up a reproach against his neighbor, grieve the Spirit of God and put Christ to open shame. Are you ready for the five-minute challenge? There are many of them dwelling on little trials. Said the angel, legions of evil angels are around you and are trying to press in their awful darkness that you may be ensnared and taken. You suffer your mind to be diverted too readily from the work of preparation and the all-important truths of these last days. And you dwell upon little trials and go into minute particulars of little difficulties to explain them to the satisfaction of this one or that. Anyone ever been guilty of that? Conversation has been protracted for? No, 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 no. Conversation has been protracted for? No, we stay. Conversation has been protracted for? Between the parties concerned. And not only has their time been wasted, but the servants of God are held to listen to them when the hearts of both parties are unsubdued by grace. If pride and selfishness were laid aside, You mean I could have done this sermon in five minutes? <laughs> five minutes would remove most difficulties. Hours have been spent in justifying self, which has grieved angels and displeased God. I saw that God will not wait and bow down and listen to long justifications and he did not want his servants to do so and precious time be wasted. That should be spent in showing transgressors the errors of their way and pulling souls out of the fire. Why five minutes, guys? Because it's very simple. He that covereth the transgression seeketh love. But he that repeated the matter separated the very friends. Or we can read it this way, hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth all sins. If I really love you, all I need to hear from you is, hey, you know what, Matt, let's, let's squash this and let's move on. I don't need you to, I don't need you to grovel. Oh, you know, and then, and I apologize. I don't need that because that's not what I'm after. I'm after souls. And you should be after souls. And if souls is the most important thing, let's not waste time trying to explain to each other, no, you know what, well, this is what I meant. Look, I don't, you know what, at this point, I don't care what you meant. If you are saying, hey, I'm down to finish the work, forget about it. Because that's what love does. Love doesn't take an account and say, well, until you make X, Y, and Z, and do this and do that, and bow and grovel, then, then maybe we can work together. No. Love is, I'm going to tell you something. Listen, five minutes. If your intent is to go prove yourself right, don't go. If your intent is to prove your brother or sister wrong, don't go. If your intent is to see your brother or sister injured, defamed, humiliated, or to lose, don't go. If your intent is to reconcile, then go. It will take five minutes. And five minutes is for those who are stubborn. <laughs> I had an incident this morning, right before the divine service. There was some conflict. And in a matter of two minutes, that conflict was done. I'm talking about a conflict that's been going on for a little while. And in a matter of two minutes, without words even being spoken, Amen. all of a sudden, what looked like a great big wall, how is this wall of Jericho going to fall? Two, it, wasn't even, it was actually like about 10 seconds. Boom, done, wall down. You guys, when we try to prove I was right and you were wrong, and until you admit that I was right and you were wrong, we get nowhere. Love says, look, 
We have a mission. Bygones are bygones. Let's move forward. And beloved, I'm going to say this. I'm, I've, I'm finished. <laughs> I might have been reading that. <laughs> I'll just tell you something. Nehemiah had a work to do. Nehemiah was called by God to do a work. And I believe that every one of us in here have been called by God to do a work. But you know Nehemiah had enemies. And you know what his enemies did to him? They would say, hey, he was up on the wall, come down, come down. Nehemiah said, I'm not coming down from this wall. I have a work to do, and, and I will stay focused on the work of God. And I'm, I'm saying this today, beloved, I'm not coming down. I have a work to do. I have a commission to accomplish something here, and, I, and I'm asking you as a church, my brothers and sisters, those of you in this church that may be like, oh, pastor, and even those of you may be like, oh, pastor, I'm asking all of you, let's do this together. Because when we don't do that, the enemy gets the victory, and all of us lose.